basic equation uh, or principle we've got there on the screen about carcass value. And in principle, the value we can extract from a carcass, be it lamb or beef, is based on those two components. It's the yield of product we've got to sell, and I call it the, the retail yield or the saleable yield, and, uh, and the eating quality of the, of the cuts in that carcass, in the fact of how that then affects the price you can extract for, uh, for the different qualities of, of product. And there are some distinct, uh, distinct differences out there in terms of what consumers uh, tell us they're willing to pay. So today I'm going to focus specifically on the yield side of things, that's where the X-ray technology is applied. But I just want to open with a couple of slides on eating quality because it is also a very important part of that equation, but it's a, a, another talk for another day. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides from some quite extensive consumer work that's been done through the Meat Standards Australia program. I hope you're all uh, familiar with, at least by name and principle, about Meat Standards Australia, a way of uh, assessing carcasses for eating quality. Very well developed in the beef industry, right down to individual carcasses by cut by cook methodology. We also do have uh, data on cut by cook at the, uh, at, for lamb carcasses. However, the lamb MSA grading program at this stage is a, a mob-based pathway, so it's considerably more fundamental and less developed than the, uh, than the beef system. However, we do actually have an uh, individual cuts model developed for, for land that we're working on bringing into industry. But, uh, in, this, uh, in the process of developing MSA, in simple terms, lots of regular people, just like you folks, the local PNC, the golf club, the, uh, the bowls club, or whatever it is, come together and eat samples of meat in a very structured and controlled manner and give us scores on those things for tenderness, juiciness, flavour and overall liking. So uh, in the process when people are doing that, we've also been asking them, what's your willingness to pay for the variation in quality you've seen or tasted of during that session? So this is one of the earlier sets of data. You can see over on the left hand side under N, there's this number, 1858 consumers in this. So 1858 regular folks like you have eaten, uh, eaten this lamb and uh, given us an MSA grading on it, so they tell us whether they like the, the juiciness, tenderness, flavour, etc. in that scoring system out of 100 points. But we've also asked them if we consider the three star, the basic pass mark for eating quality, to be 100%, what are you willing to pay for variation in quality around that? And you can see if it doesn't grade, they've told us they're willing to pay about half. They want to penalise it if it doesn't eat well, which is fair enough. We all uh, expect quality when we, we pay for things. But if it's considerably better, if it starts to step up, if it's a four star, it tells us they're willing to pay one and a half times the uh, amount for a three star and two times the amount for a five star. So clear indication from those consumers, 1,800 plus of them, that they are prepared to pay more if we present them with a quality product in a reliable manner. So just to take that uh, same concept uh, a little more broadly, this is some work that was done last year through uh, the Sheep Cooperative Research Centre. USA, China and Australia, 720 consumers in each of those countries. So again, we've got adds up over 2,000 consumers uh, eating these samples. And these samples range from, uh, from lamb out to foretooth. So uh, we also looked out well past the, the lamb definition stage um, to see what consumers thought about that hogget and uh, yielding type product. And what was, I guess, pleasing, um, maybe surprising, is they told us exactly the same thing as that first lot of Australian consumers. They want to pay about half if it doesn't meet the, meet the basic eating quality standard. They're prepared to pay about one and a half times if it goes from a three star to a four star. And they're prepared to pay about double if it goes from a four star to a five star. Very, very consistent um, across, uh, across countries. Those examples are both, in, uh, are both in lamb, or in that case going out into, uh, into uh, two and four tooth uh, carcasses. This is a beef slide. And guess what? It says exactly the same thing. Half if it doesn't grade, one and a half if it's a four star, around two times if it's a five star. And you may not be able to read all these names down the back, but uh, Poland, France, Republic of South Africa, USA, Japan, Ireland, and, uh, and our, our local Aussie consumers there. Maybe not surprisingly, the one that jumps out up here is the Japanese. They're, uh, as a, as a nation with their waggy beef background, are quite accustomed to paying a lot of money for a, a very high end or, or premium product. So probably not surprising they jump out of the pack a bit there. But I guess the, the point is that consumers really do value quality. 
They tell us that they're prepared to pay for it. And pleasingly, they're very consistent in what they say. So I uh, just wanted to open with that because I'm going to talk about, uh, about x-rays and we're going to talk about carcass yield. And uh, one of the things we have to manage in industry in terms of how we, uh, we grade and value carcasses is that the relationship between carcass yield and eating quality is a negative relationship. It's an undesirable relationship. So if we were just to go out there and select for really, really high yielding carcasses, we will select just by through with no genetic responses, we will select for less eating quality over time. That doesn't mean we can't select for yield and select for eating quality simultaneously, but we have to do them both in a managed, simultaneous manner. And it's no different um, if, uh, as breeders of livestock. We know that um, if you select for high growth rate, indirectly you also select for high birth weights, unless you manage birth weight at the same time. So it's the same principle. Not a problem, but we need to be aware of it and we need to manage it. So I'm now going to move off the eating quality side of things, but I just want to open with that to reinforce just how important it is, and, uh, and move on to the yield story. There's a couple of, uh, in current terms, slightly above average carcass weight carcasses. 23, 23 and a half kilos. Score four, score two. And you can see uh, the difference in uh, saleable meat yield that comes out of those two carcasses. 48% out of the uh, score four carcass, 56% out of the score two. You can see a real impact just in terms of having that a higher proportion of that car carcass weight as fat. And if we take that through and uh, we put that through uh, normal sort of retail cuts that I would go through a butcher shop, we can break them down, we can cut them into uh, you know, various uh, cuts, trim, bone, fat, what have you that's uh, essentially thrown away. And what that adds up to is about 2.7 kilos difference in saleable weight out of those two carcasses. So for your butcher to put that across his counter, he'll have 2.7 kilos of X difference in saleable meat or saleable product. There's obviously some bone and fat in the saleable product component between those two carcasses. That's worth 30 to $40 dollars over the counter right now today. That's the sort of difference we can impact in carcass value in terms of how we, uh, we present carcasses into, into the lamb, lamb chain. I'm, by the way, I'm more than happy to have people jump in and ask questions on the fly. Um, we'll have time at the end, but if there's something that really uh, triggers, uh, triggers your uh, thought at the time, please feel free to uh, just whip your hand up and jump in. Happy to field things as we go. So uh, I was asked today really talk about the X-ray technology, and there's, there's three three versions that are out there, I guess, at the moment. Um, <coughs> Sexa, Dexa, and Mexa. Um, and they're, uh, in principle, not that different. They're all X-ray technologies, but they're different. Uh, they are different in the sense that uh, how they work. Um, Sexa being single energy, Dexa being dual energy, and that's the one we'll talk about uh, in detail. And we're still very much at a, a research level around Mexa or multi-energy X-rays. But still, the principle of X-ray, we're all familiar with that, I'm sure. You've all either had a broken bone or know somebody who's had a broken bone and seen the nice little image. Uh, as they've come out of the uh, out of the out of the hospital, so it's, in principle, it's not different to that. The initial work uh, that happened in this place in processing was with single energy X-ray, and that was in, put in place to drive robotic cutting. And they, the reason uh, that you use X-ray, as you can see in that photograph, you can actually do very good definition of the skeleton within the carcass, the bone structure. And when you've got bone structure, you can then use that to drive, uh, drive automated, uh, pro some of your processes it aut automatically, and you can do so very, very precisely. To move into uh, the dual energy technology, that was really driven by wanting then to be able to go beyond just knowing where the bone structures are, to being able to try and differentiate in that carcass the three, you know, the three tissue types, if I can call them tissues in a, in a carcass, there's bone, there's fat, and there's lean, or muscle. They're the three things that make up a carcass. Um, in, uh, in simple terms. So the desire to test and research the DEXA side of things was to see whether we could move beyond knowing what the skeleton structure looks like to still knowing the skeleton structure and adding to that knowledge of what made up that carcass, what was its proportional makeup of bone fat and muscle, and then how that relates through to the, uh, the commercial value of that carcass as I just demonstrated in that simple uh, fat score difference. So, so the 2D X-ray, 
A lot of that work was developed by a company called Scott Automation and Robotics. They're based in Dunedin, uh, in uh, South Island, New Zealand, but they also have offices here in uh, in both Sydney uh, and in Melbourne. And they're um, in the land side of things. They're certainly the, the leading leading company in this part of the world, developing uh, robotic systems to uh, to cut carcasses. And they put the uh, the application of that 2D X-ray to know where the bones are. I just uh, I'll just show you a quick video um, so you can see that uh, see that in action and get a sense of so this is uh, one of these systems is currently operating in uh, in the Abattoir in Border Town in South Australia and there's one uh, literally within the next couple of weeks starting to be uh, and again, literally lowered through the roof into the uh, the land plant in uh, the land plant in, in Brooklyn, in Melbourne. So you can see there, you saw the X-ray warning. These carcasses are just on a normal chain. They've come through a little room, a little tunnel where the X-ray system is, and then they come into the saws. So the first saw you can see is taking off the forequarter, and then the second saw is uh, is separating the middle from the hindquarter. And they are down to the millimetre precision on the on the on the bone structure. The other thing to uh, just, if you can see enough details, clicking down the back, I mean, there's a little bit just there, but look at how little fling there is off these saws. I'm sure you've all put a fair few uh, lamps through the bandsaw in your, in your days, and how much sawdust you end up uh, with at the end of a couple of lambs. So imagine these plants doing thousands a day if they created the same sort of sawdust we create with our bandsaws, but these saws cut phenomenally clean. So again, just a different view there, the four quarters taken off down onto a conveyor, the middle is taken off, we'll see the middle being processed. The, uh, the hind quarters, again, they move on into, a, into another section for, for further processing. So you see that's now coming down onto this uh, rotational arm. The see a flash of light here, that's a camera that works out the position so you understand what the shape is. And there, just watch a little hole at the end of that. That's a, a suction process that sucks the spinal cord out. So uh, if you want to get uh, lamb into, into Europe, for instance, it has to go through a spinal cord from a, a BSC re regulation perspective. So that's just using vacuum to literally suck that spinal cord out as it goes through. Then we move on here into further processing of the, of the middles. Um, the, uh, the ribs or the rack can be separated into two, the four and the, oh, the hind section of the middle. The ribs can be cut to whatever the market length is. The market might want 70 mil rack length, they might want 80 mil. That's all can be pre-programmed into the system. And you've got these two saws here that uh, take out. That's probably a better angle there. That's the process is known as moving the chime, which basically takes out that uh, centre of the spine as it splits those racks in two. And that's a really important process for accuracy, because doing that by hand, if you get it wrong, you take too much off one side, you essentially then can't sell that as a rack. You've then got to further process it because people don't want to buy something that's been cut incorrectly on the uh, on the uh, on the process of removing that uh, that chime section of the spine. And then uh, obviously then they move off and uh, those racks have been Frenched. They would have been water pressure Frenched. So you know, water pressure systems that just blast all the uh, the meat and tissue off the off the uh, rib bones in the rack. If you haven't been in the plant and seen that, and then into the uh, into the vacuum packing processes. That's a, a very, very quick snapshot of, uh, of the process. But that's where the X-ray started, was driving that cutting system. The, um, the benefits, I guess, that have come out of this in particular are the very precise cutting. And this might sound like a trivial amount of meat, but you know, you've got a gap about so big between your ribs. If you take, uh, if you say, uh, take your middle, your four quarters probably worth about a third of the price of the middle and your hindquarters worth about half the price of the middle. Bear with me, that's a pretty rough, uh, rough uh, split, but it's good enough. If you put that much weight from the forequarter back onto the middle and from the hindquarter back onto the middle, and you do that on um, thousands of lambs every week, that actually adds up to quite a lot of money. So something as simple as that actually makes a lot of money out of one of these systems. The other thing that's been very good is the, uh, is the occupational health side of things. The most, one of the most dangerous jobs in a processing plant are the fellows who run the big saws. And uh, you can imagine picking up carcasses that weigh anywhere between 16 or 18 up to 30 kilos, hour after hour, and shoving them through those big bed saws. So it's a very dangerous bit of gear. They pay those, those workers a significant premium on their salaries, and they still struggle to get people to do it.
it's physically very hard work and it's, and it's dangerous work. So it takes that out. The other things that have really been successful in, the, in that process is the, the cleanliness of the cutting, so that the, as you move into further fabrication down the line, that cut is in the right place every single time. So when you're moving into boning processes, you don't get uh, racks come in with half the last rib nip, nipped off and you've got to do something else with it and so forth. So there's been quite good efficiencies flow through in the boning room. So that's where this uh, x-ray story started. And um, unfortunately, and I'll make this sound easy, it's, uh, but unfortunately it's actually very easy to change that 2D x-ray. On the left hand side there you've got an x-ray emitter, on the right hand side there's images of the detector panels. And essentially it's, a, I'll say simple, in inverted commas, it's as simple as upgrading those two <coughs> components in that machinery and uh, hey presto you've got yourself a dual energy x-ray. And we were lucky that uh, the, uh, you know, the processing plant at uh, Border Town, the, uh, which is a JBS plant, um, very collaborative and uh, worked very openly with us uh, in this development process with, along with uh, Scott uh, Automation. So I will actually at this point just acknowledge, I know where there's a love-hate relationship between producers and processors, but uh, from a research manager's perspective, we get some very, very good collaboration with some of the advertisers in the country, yeah. um, and not just JBSTs, Thomas Foods, uh, right across the board. So we're, we're very fortunate that they do engage with us well. I just wanted to show you a picture of CT scanning. This is a, uh, I'll say a standard in inverted commas, medical grade CT. If you uh, were unfortunate enough to need to have a, a head scan or a body scan and what have you and they wear you off the hospital, they'll put you through one of these things. So these are the uh, basically the highest accuracy body composition scanning that I'm aware of the, in the world, these CT scanners. Nothing unique in Australia, they're all around the world. We've got uh, one of those, uh, we, the university where I'm based, University of New England, Armadale. We've got a CT scanner in the animal house there. There's uh, a CT scanner in uh, Adelaide University. There's one at Murdoch University. We've actually got one of these sitting in a special little room in the JBS plant in, uh, in Melbourne at Brooklyn that we can use for research within the, in the abattoir. Come invested with Scott Technology and, and JBS hosting it for us. So I just wanted to put that up and make sure everyone knows what a CT scanner is. So I'm going to talk about how the x-ray process predicts carcass composition relative to CT. So this is our standard that we measure ourselves against. How well can we get the dual energy x-ray to predict carcass competition, carcass composition, sorry, relative to CT. So just to make sure everyone's clear on what the CT stands for. Um, it's commuted, computed tomography, if you want the full word. Okay, this has been a long, long journey. It might appear like it's appeared in the press in the last uh, eight to 12 months and come out of nowhere, but uh, it, goes, it goes back a long way. In fact, the Kiwis started work on this well before uh, we did in Australia. And I'll, I'll show you a timeline in a minute. But this was the, uh, the New Zealand results that basically got us interested and said we should jump in here and start investing in this on behalf of the Australian industry. And you can see there's two value sets there, a green set and a blue set. You can count the dots, there's eight of them. I think it might be nine green ones, eight. Uh, six blue ones, eight green ones, that's how many animals were scanned. So we're talking very, very small set of data here. So accept that, uh, please accept that as it is. So on the vertical axis was our CT prediction of fat, and on the, uh, the horizontal axis, the, the DEXA value estimating that fat component. And you can see there that it did a very good job of, of predicting that. Very small weight range though. The Kiwis were really excited. They thought they'd created a massive range in their data set with 15 to 22 kilos, which is uh, very small compared to what we, what we see here, of course. But the two numbers, again, you'll see that'll come up is a number called an R squared, and that basically describes how much of the variation that the CT can describe can be described by the, by the DEXA. And the, uh, the RSME, or statistical measure, the statistical measure, root mean squared error, it uh, describes how much variation there is around that prediction relationship. So it makes sense? So we've got how well the data fits on the line and then how much variation there is around that. Um, and in simple terms, we want R squared's high and we want errors low. Um, and here endeth the, uh, the stats lesson. So that's, where we, that's what got us interested. This is the, uh, the Australian journey going on from there, starting in 2012. But to so say, this work was done in New Zealand to start with, and there were Australian researchers working with the Kiwis at the time. Um, but before 2012, when MLA decided we should get into this space on behalf of industry, 
The Kiwis had 13 failed iterations of trying to get X-ray to predict carcass composition. And that data I just showed you, that was iteration 14. So it was a, quite a long journey before we even got to that point. So uh, there's a lot of people invested a lot of time uh, in this. Um, but we have progressed pretty quickly since uh, it's sort of cracking that uh, good small set of data from New Zealand. So uh, the, the uh, first prototypes, as you can see, went, uh, went in a couple of years ago. That machine that I just showed you is sitting down in, uh, in Border Town in South Australia. One of, uh, one of JBS's plants, and uh, that was the, that's the first operational unit. It's been running there for a couple of years now, and it uh, processes easily at line speed. In fact, you can, uh, it would be, the actual X-ray machine could handle two processing lines. It can scan them that quickly. Um, so it's very, it very much fits in a commercial high-speed chain doing 12, 13 lambs a minute. Um, I'm sure you, I hope you've been in an abattoir and seen them go, because they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty fast-moving machines, the, uh, the lamb plants. So we've collected a lot of calibration data, and we're really now up in here about supporting further adoption, and you've seen a fair bit of that uh, in the press, I'm sure. Um, JBS, they're fully convinced it's a good thing for them. They've got a new one of those, uh, what's called a leaf machine, that automatic processing I've just shown you. They've got the latest version of that literally uh, being installed right now. Um, and uh, talking with one of their fellows yesterday, um, I suspect it'll be, uh, be turned on in, uh, in down in Brooklyn, in Melbourne, September, early October at this stage. Um, so that's our, that's our development phase. Just want you to understand there's a lot of, a lot of time going into this because I've heard a few people suggest that it sort of just appeared overnight, but most of the things that appear overnight have had long gestation lengths. Just bore you with a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of science or a bit of data here. I'll try not to bore you, but MLA funds a program called a resource flock where we bring 22 to 2400 lambs a year out of a whole range of about 150 uh, industry size that are, are uh, the semen is uh, we, we, we nominate what we want but essentially it's donated to us by the ram breeders around the country and we get very good support from a lot of ram breeders collaborating in this sort of research. This represents 600 of lambs um, that were bred in, uh, at the Kirby Research Station which is owned by the University in Armadale. And uh, we shipped these 600 lambs down to Border Town. We're just out of Border Town, and we put them in a feedlot so we could uh, manage them there. And we took them to Border Town, of course, because that's where the, uh, the Dexa machine was. Simple, simple reason why we sent them halfway across the country. Put them in a feedlot and killed them in six 100 head kills. So you can see each coloured dot there represents a kill starting from uh, 24th of June going through 30th of September. I remember I said the Kiwis were really excited when they got 15 to, to 22 kilos in their. Uh, in their data set that they varied. We can see we've got uh, weights down there around the uh, 12 or 13 kilos, right up to uh, almost on 40 kilos carcass weight up here. And we've got fat from right down uh, in the, well in the low score one scores, under five mils, right up to, uh, to about 45 mils. So it's a massive variation, represents Merino's crossbreds composite type sheet. Uh, so it covers a lot of the genetic diversity in the country and a massive weight and fat range, which is really, really important because we want to make sure this technology, if we're going to use it, can handle those animals that are light and skinny and we could also predict those animals that are heavy and fat. So it's important to create that sort of range. You might think we've sort of pushed it to the extremes, but there's a, there's a method to the madness of doing that because you want to make sure if you've got a prediction technology, it can handle whatever you throw at it. Just to give a... Just think about these animals up here. You know, we're talking 35, 40 kilo carcasses, 35, 40 mils of GR. I'm sure you're all familiar with GR. What do you think? Just tell me, what do you think the proportion of fat in a carcass like that might be? Do you have a sense of that? How much of that carcass weight's actually fat? 15. Give me a number, throw a number out. 15%. 15, okay, let's have an auction, let's go up. We're making money here, we're selling it for dearer than 15. Who wants to, who wants to bid higher? Don't be shy. 25? Keep going. 33. Keep going. 40. You've won the prize. 40%. The, the worst, I'll say the worst, carcass out of all those, of the carcass weight, 40% of it was fat. Right. So it's pretty hard, to, pretty hard to imagine, isn't it? But uh, that's what animals will do if you, uh, if you keep feeding them. And uh, obviously they're out of commercial spec. I'm not suggesting anyone's out there trying to do that. But yeah. I was with... A JBS fellow yesterday who shares an office with the uh, the head uh, land buyer for JBS, 
and he told me he was sitting next to his mate in the office the other day and his mate let out a groan and he asked why and he'd had a line of just over 400 lambs from one vendor averaged 36 kilos carcass weight. So guess what? They're out here. 36 kilo carcass weight. So I'll bet he had some carcasses there that were 40% fat. So I'm not surprised he was groaning. So uh, they do exist, believe it or not, but uh, unfortunately we have to deal with that. So I just want to show you that that's the sort of detail we've needed to create in terms of the, the carcass populations to test this from a land perspective. So I'm going to take you through just a couple of these scatter plots now. And again, I don't want to sort of get hung up on the, on the statistical side of things, but you can see uh, the, uh, the regression line, CT fat as our, uh, what we're trying to predict, and X are predicted fat, how well does it do it? And we've got uh, quite, a good, uh, quite a good estimate there, the, uh, that R squared of 88, so it's describing 88% of that variation and uh, the error around that of 1.5 CT fat units. So quite small considering there's a 25% uh, variation in, in fat units there, or 25 fat units. That was a small earlier data set. Here's a big set of data with those, uh, those 600 lambs aggregated in it. There's a lot of dots over the top of each other there, but that's what it is. And you see our, our accuracy of uh, that relationship between the predicted and the actual fat from uh, from DEXA relative to CT has now gone up to 0.92 and our errors come down. So we've actually got better at that. So we'll, we'll never get any worse than that. Our statisticians might find better ways to analyze the images and what have you, but that's a really, really good predictive capacity and way ahead of anything that uh, industry has ever seen. So what about some other things in abattoirs? Obviously, uh, question down the back, sir. Oh, uh, are we predicting intramuscular fat or just external, uh, external fat here? Or are we no, it's not, this is not intramuscular fat. This is the, the total body fat, total. of which intramuscular fat is a very small proportion. So it's, but it's predicting your self-contained <laughs> channel fat, someone like that here. Intramuscular fat, that's a very important part of the eating quality story. And we're working on that separately, but it's not part of what I'm going to cover today, but happy to have a chat with you afterwards if you'd like. And just to make sure very clear on that, intramuscular fat, or marbling as it's called in beef, we rarely see marbling in lamb. You don't see flecks of fat through the, through the eye muscle tissue in lamb very, very often like you do in beef. But it's a very important component of the eating quality story in terms of juiciness and flavour, how do consumers uh, respond to the eating quality. Richard, do you think that's an aspect that's being neglected or could be um, built upon as more intramuscular fat in lamb? Uh, it's certainly something we're very conscious of now after this, after you know, the research that's been going on our eating quality. From the, uh, the Cooperative Research Centre and the, the, the resource flock investments, both through the CRC and, and MLA, additionally after the CRC invested in that area, based on, I'd say, 14 or 15,000 lambs that have been taken through to have chemical extracts of intramuscular fat. So you take a line sample and you take it in a laboratory and you chemically extract the fat. That's, you know, the, the way you determine intramuscular fat. Um, Australian lambs running at about 4.2% uh, on average. Uh, they were crossbred lambs, sorry. Crossbred lambs are running about 4.2%. Um, higher merino con lambs will, will generally be a little bit higher than that. Um, and that's not a bad space to be. So we know other, other proteins have got well down below 1% and they've had some issues with, with dryness and, and flavour and so forth. So, so where we're at now is pretty good. So where we're at is, is okay, yeah. but we don't want to see it decline. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, the undesirable relationship between yield and eating quality. Yeah. And you know, the things that, couple of, some of the things that drive yield are things that are really important for, for you folks in terms of on-farm profit. High growth rate, well-muscled animals that are relatively lean. All those things are good for, for production efficiency they're not good for eating quality. So that's the, that's the challenge we've got to, got to balance. And in that sense, uh, from a genetics perspective, we now actually have genomic predictions for intramuscular fat and another characteristic called shear force, which is a, a, a laboratory measure of how much pressure is required to, to cut through a piece of meat. So uh, we have genomic predictions now for merinos, pole lawsuits, white suffix, and border lesters currently can get uh, genomic, uh, take a blood sample, get a genomic test done and get a, a, a strange sheep breeding value for intramuscular fat and shear force. So breeders are starting to work, actively work on that now. So going back to the abattoir factors, obviously some abattoirs work differently. They're pretty hostile environments, as I'm sure you know. They're 
they're wet, they're cold, they're warm in places, um, a lot of humidity, a lot of power sources floating around in there that can interrupt things. Some, some spray chill, some don't. So we started looking at some of these factors to see how, how robust the, the x-ray systems were against them. So had a look at spray chilling, didn't have any, any impact in, uh, in the work we've done so far. So it doesn't matter whether the plant spray chills or not, the x-ray system holds up okay. Carcass orientation, yes, that does affect the x-ray. But it's not a problem commercially because the orientation of that carcass is controlled on the, uh, is controlled on the chain. So uh, that's uh, readily managed. Carcass temperature and time post-mortem, they're related but not quite the same. And um, so we know carcass temperature, we uh, x-rayed lambs that were, were hot, essentially straight after they were killed. They were then done at 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours and 72 hours, and the predictions were all the same. So comfortable doesn't, you can do them hot or cold. And that opens up where a processor may choose to use this sort of technology in, the, in their business. Time post-mortem. Yes, it does, uh, does have an effect, but we can account for that, so we're okay with the fact that we know about it and we can deal with it. So quite robust across a number of things that uh, would affect uh, commercial application. The other thing we started to pull apart, and this, this is I'm still focused completely on sheep here, folks, um, because we had that really nice data set I just showed you the scatter plot of. But well, what happens about uh, what happens if we uh, look at males versus females, or weathers versus uh, females rather than males. Um, are there any biases across sexes? So that's been analysed and you can see there there's a little bit of under prediction of the, uh, the fat content in a female, a little bit of over prediction of the fat content in a male. But let's put that in context of the scale. No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> You're a brave man, Monty. <laughs> I've got two teenage boys I keep telling them there's a very fine line between bravery and foolishness. Let's both try and keep on the right side. Um, but we put that in the scale of what's really the variation that's out there. I said there is 20, 25 uh, CT, 25% or 25 CT unit variation in uh, in fat. So that bias from male or female, it's trivial, really, really small. What about breeds? Obviously breeds have quite some quite different uh, carcass attributes. And it's not every breed in the country, but uh, it's a pretty good uh, representation of the majority of our, our lamb supply. Um, so again, we can see we've got some breeds and more of the, uh, like the border lesters, the specialist maternals, being a little bit under-predicted. The merinos a little under-predicted for their, uh, their fat content. And our terminal size, they could worse than any slip in there as well. Could worse are probably a little bit lower than expected, but there's a lot of the with sheep are composites these days, and there's actually quite a bit of particularly white suffolk genetics floating around in Coopworth composites. And they're quite open about that. That's not a not a derogatory comment about them, it's just what they are. But you see the, the most uh, our heaviest muscle breed, the Texel, is the uh, you know, generally the, the heaviest muscle and leanest amongst those terminal size. It's getting a little bit a uh, little bit over predicted for the amount of fat. But you see that's basically plus or minus 1%. So again, let's just put that back on the real scale of the variation that's uh, there in, in industry or in this industry data set. And again, it's really quite small. So could we adjust for that mathematically in, a, in, a, in an output from a DEXA? Yes, we could. Is it worth it? We don't believe so, because then you have to identify genetics in every lamb that comes through. You have to identify sex and so forth. So, but we're comfortable that we, we have looked at it, we know it's there, but it's very small and uh, comfortable that uh, we, can, uh, we can live with that sort, of, uh, that sort of error being in there in the big picture. Again, what about animals that have got real genetic diversity? <clears throat> so again, we've got our fat, um, CT fat on the vertical axis, on our horizontal axis, that's the post weaning eye muscle depth, Australian sheep breeding value, <coughs> and uh, the, the fat depth breeding value. So you can see, again, we get a little uh, under prediction on our really heavily muscled, uh, we're talking about the, the left hand side graph there, a little under prediction on our really lightly muscled animals, sorry, and a little over prediction on our really heavily muscled animals. Similarly with fat, on our really lean animals, we get a little under prediction. On our really genetically fat animals, we get a little over prediction. But again, I'll put that on the, uh, on the real scale for you. 
Excuse me. And it's, it's half and not much. So very confident that we can put those mixed sex, mixed breeds through the, uh, through the x-ray system and uh, we're not suffering from any particular breed, sex, genetic diversity uh, bias that's uh, significant and we should be concerned about. That's sort of that's the, the, the sheep story, and then moving into beef. Now beef is very much a, a more recent uh, work, and you can see the timelines there, sort of really starting in the, in 2016, whereas lamb had all that work done pre 2012, and and uh, and we jumped into it in Australia in 2012. And there's a, there's a simple reason why we got into this in lamb earlier than beef. One was that it fitted into that uh, robotic cutting system where the single lens X-ray was. The other one is. It's much cheaper and quicker to do research on lambs than it is in beef, because they're obviously a lot smaller, they're easier to handle, per carcass they're worth a lot less. And so if you can't get something like this to work in a carcass that ranges from 20 to 30 kilos, how are you going to get it to work in a carcass that ranges uh, you know, 10 to 15 fold that? So it's uh, a logical reason why beef followed on after we had a lot of confidence in lamb. So that's our timelines, we're here, and at the moment, um, there is actually that the first, it comes now as a commercial install, there is actually a previous iteration of DEXA which uh, is in the Dinmore plant in, in Brisbane. Uh, it's a different configuration, but it is running an automatic rip cutting system uh, as we speak. It was the first, uh, first dual energy attempt. Our, our current, what we're calling the current sort of first commercial install is, is the current iteration of the technology where we've got to, and that's uh, being put into a, a tease plant in, in Rockhampton, literally. It's happening right now, so uh, they expect to be turning that on in the trial phase in the, in the next month or two. And uh, then obviously we're going to go back, we're going to need to get more carcass, more beef carcasses, and I'll show you some beef numbers, but we haven't done a lot of beef yet. Uh, we need to check those processing factors in lamb, that we checked in lamb, the sexes, the genetic diversity, the spray chillings, and repeat that work in beef, again to give us confidence that that holds up across species and not just, not just assume that it does. And that's going to take us a little bit of time, and as I say, it's considerably more costly when you've uh, got to think of the value of a beef carcass. So here's a little bit of the early, early beef story. And again, be conscious of the number of dots on this, uh, on these graphs. A whole eight. This was a uh, a whole eight quarters, not even whole eight carcasses. So we started small. Um, I mentioned we had that seat with that CT scanner that sits in the uh, the abattoir, JBS abattoir in, in Brooklyn, in Melbourne. Tees have co-invested uh, with us, and they actually have a DEXA in a shipping container. It's commonly referred to here, if you hear someone talk about the DEXA in a box, well, that's what it is. It's a DEXA machine in a shipping container. Now, we've had that shipping container during this research sitting outside the cool room uh, in, uh, in Melbourne so that we can CT them, get our really high accuracy measure, then we can DEXA them and do it all there in the cold chain so we can minimise the loss of carcass value, because that's one of the, the, the big hits in, in terms of the cost of doing this work if we lose the carcass value by taking it out of the cold chain. So you know, it's really interesting you talk about collaboration. You know, see two of the biggest competitors in the country prepared to put their gear side by side and uh, work collaboratively on, a, on an industry project, and uh, it's a very positive thing for them to do. But you can see again the, uh, the R squared type values, a little bit lower here in this one on the, on the four quarter uh, muscle component in the point eights, the early point nines in the, uh, in the two upper, upper graphs there. So again, that was the first little look in beef and uh, it was positive and gave us confidence to move forward a bit further. Now this one uh, has 50 whole carcasses. So that's the next step in beef. And we can see predicting the, the lean content, the fat content, the bone content. We've got these, uh, this R squared value, how much of the variation is, is, the, uh, is the DEXA, um, predicting relative to the, C, to the CT, what CT tells us. And we're in the uh, you know, 0.7s to, to 0.9. So again, very good, very useful error areas. The, uh, the error component, so the, the spread around that line, is about double what it is in lamb at the moment, but still uh, well within a range that uh, is, uh, is commercially applicable and, uh, and that we're comfortable we can work with. Again, some uh, ways of looking at how well things predict. So. What's the relationship between four quarters left and right, hind quarters left and right, four quarters, hind quarters, and so forth? And that relationship is all up in the uh, in the mid to high point nines, which means it's almost one. One means it's perfectly the same, 
So that's a, in terms of relationship across those quarters, um, that's again a very positive outcome and, and gives us uh, gives us confidence to keep pushing ahead and uh, do more animals and further develop the uh, the ways to analyse that data. So again, those carcass things, we have done some, and again, so we're only 50 carcasses, so we're still on the journey in beef, but um, had a look at the scanning orientation, and there is some effect there on that <coughs> carcass orientation, as there was in lamb, but again, that's not really a concern to us, because that's controllable. It's controlled in the plant, particularly if you take it to a, connect it to some automation in cutting, well, obviously the carcass has to be presented in, the, in a consistent fashion, so that's not a problem. Had a look at spray chilling, again, on a small data set, no, no effect has been picked up to date, so that uh, supports what we found in, in lamb. So we need to do more of both those, and we certainly need to do more of that repeatability work to understand that uh, it holds up across bigger carcass ranges, weight, both weight and fat, and, uh, and uh, across the spread we see in industry. So I guess uh, the other question is, you know, how are we going to try and manage this as uh, processes take it up? Um, you know, T has got a beef unit going in now, there's uh, the second uh, lamb, well, there's actually two other automated cutting systems in Australia outside of the, the JBS one I've shown you and the one they're putting in in Melbourne, Australian Land Company at Colac and uh, at the other, their, their cutting room at Sunshine in Melbourne. They have those four automation systems in there. They're currently running on single energy x-rays, so they can readily upgrade that. So I guess one of the interesting questions then is going to be, uh, how do you calibrate these things across industry? How do we have confidence that if you send it to one plant that you're going to get uh, a repeatable measure across other plants. It's no different to um, we drive into a service station on a regular basis and we trust that when that pump says it gave us 90 litres of diesel, it did actually give us close enough to 90 litres of diesel. And there's a thing called the National Measurement Institute in Australia that legislates and checks all those sorts of things. <coughs> so we're going to need to have the same sort of capacity and this is what we're working on at the moment. If anyone can speak Danish, please tell me what that says, but this is the bit that counts we can read. Mobile CT scanning, this is the Danish pork industry. They have a CT scanner in that rig and they cart it around Europe and, uh, and calibrate systems in the, in the pig industry in Denmark. And uh, So we're currently looking at uh, developing the same thing here and putting a, a CT scanner. So instead of having that CT scanner sitting, for instance, in the abattoir in, in Melbourne, where it is at the moment, let's mount her up in a, uh, into, a, uh, into a trailer and then we can take it on site into abattoirs to do calibration, we can take it to research sites and so forth and it's cheaper to move the gear around like that than it is to send 600 lambs to border town and put them in a feedlot for two months and, and so forth. So uh, both industry calibration investment and, a, uh, and an industry, uh, ongoing industry research tool. So that's uh, one of the next things we're working on is our, is our industry calibration standards. We also have a program of work that's uh, working on this area plus other areas eating quality and around the intramuscular fat story and what have you. We were fortunate enough, uh, MLA and Murdoch University led a bid uh, for a competitive grant program called Rural R&D for Profit that the uh, federal government brought out 18 months ago or so now. Um, in round two we were able to secure $4.8 million out of that grant. Um, matched by cash and in kind, variably across all those people. And you can see a couple of our major processes, JBS, Tees, Harvey Beef over in WA, Australian Country Choice, Australian Land Company, what have you, are all direct collaborators in this. We're also working with the, uh, the pork industry, so it's a multi-species multi, uh, multi -species co investment. And uh, so our collaborative program there has got, in round figures, $12 million to invest in, in the next uh, four years focused on these yield and eating quality technologies in abattoirs. So we've well progressed on the yield, putting my lamb bias hat on. The tool that I'm really trying to get nailed out of that for industry is a way to assess intramuscular fat at line speed in, a, in an abattoir. And that will then allow us to really leapfrog into the, the cuts-based, more in-depth MSA grading of lamb and have much more capacity to really differentiate and create more value in our lamb products. So uh, that's a, an ongoing piece of work that uh, I look forward to uh, catching up with you on the year or two uh, to uh, let you know how that's going. Mr Chairman, I'll uh, wrap it up there. Happy to take some questions.